Welcome to the Gilded Age and Progressive Era, a podcast about the United States and the world in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. I'm your host, Michael Patrick Cullinane. Welcome back, everyone. After more than a year of recording, it's possible to take stock and think about what's been covered on the podcast and where I've neglected important and relevant topics. And while everyone is going to have suggestions about where we can shine the light, there are some things that are unique to the Gilded Age and Progressive Era that we do need to shine a light on, and populism is one of them. While populism outside the United States can mean a style of politics that relies on appealing to the emotions of voters, in the United States, it means that as well as a political party and movement that took shape in the late 19th century. I was about to say it was born out of the unique struggles of farmers and laborers in the Midwest and the South, but my guests today dispute that and call it a transnational movement. But before we get into populism, allow me to say another word on the things I've missed or the omissions. I spent a great deal of time speaking to guests about Gilded Age New York, you know, the cocktails, the lavish parties. And we've talked a little bit about California and the railroads that connected the East and the West and the small towns in between. But I've bypassed one of our largest and most complex states. I left out Texas. How could I? Well, today we put that right. Today, we'll talk about Texas and populism, two birds with one stone. And it's not a force combo, as my guests tell me, because Texas is the birthplace of populism. And because everything is bigger in Texas, the show is bigger than normal. I'm speaking with two guests, and I brought a co-host along. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Jeff Wells, the Denison Vaughn Johnson Chair of History at Dickinson State University, an expert on populism that spread through the Midwest in the 19th century. Jeff is also a colleague, and he's a former reform journalist. He's written several articles on journalism in the period and the editors that have wielded a pen for populism. This podcast was actually Jeff's idea, and all credit is due to him for it. He brought in our two guests, Professor Greg Cantrell and Professor Tom Alter. Greg is the Irma and Ralph Lowe Chair in Texas History at Texas Christian University. He's Texas-biased, having grown up and taught there, but he comes with a handful of deeply researched books on the state, including A History of Texas, and most recently, The People's Revolt, Texas Populist and the Roots of American Liberalism. Tom is a professor of history at Texas State University, where he was recently appointed, and his first book is making a big splash on state history. It's called Towards a Cooperative Commonwealth, Transplanted Roots of Farmer Labor Radicalism in Texas. It's great to have you all on the show, Jeff, Greg, and Tom. Great to be here. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for having me. Very glad to be here. Okay, so I just want to start off with a broad general question. So we haven't talked about Texas in the Gilded Age and Progressive Era, and that seems like a great omission. Uh, Jeff, when I when I talked to Jeff about uh, what we need to talk about next, Texas sprung to the top of his list. And I just wanted to know from both of you, uh, that is Tom and Greg, what, if anything, makes Texas unique in the Gilded Age and Progressive Era? And let's, let's start with Greg. Well, I, you know, I don't know how... I don't know that Texas is is entirely unique. I think it has a lot in common with other places. Uh, it is it is certainly true that Texas, it, t- to the extent that populism uh, sprang from the Farmers Alliance, then we can say that Texas was the birthplace of populism, since it was the birthplace of the Farmers Alliance. So, so it's unique in that respect. Texas also you know, has has its own long history of weirdness, like being its own independent republic um, and having had a, an Indian frontier much longer than any other any other of the southern southern or, or Midwestern states. Um, and of course, Texas, its sheer size and diversity makes it different than a lot of places. Yeah. And so I would add to that also you have it's very much the Indian frontier, as Greg mentioned, and also uh, international frontier. The border with Mexico adds uh, another component to it as well. Populism is obviously a massive political movement. And I guess one of the things that I want to talk to you about in your books is that um, should we describe it as a political ideology? Or should we describe it as a political methodology? I mean, what is it historically? And, you know, we can think about that all the way up to today. What is it back then up to today? And, and maybe, Tom, you want to take that to start. Ooh, <laughs> ideology or methodology? That's a that's a good question. Um, I would put it in 
Well, populism contains so much within it, so it's hard to pin it down to a particular ideology. I mean, it was a multi-class party where you had figures like Tom Watson in it, who had more tenants on his farm than his grandfather or how their grandfather had slaves. So you have various ideologies within it. Um, you could producerism, I'd say would probably be one of the um, ideologies kind of could kind of go through a lot of it that those that do the actual work to produce things should enjoy the fruits of their labor. And there's some methodology in it. And then they felt that the government should work for the people. But how they did that, there's very strange within populism, contested within populism. And so what are some of the, the things that, you know, you, you might reflect on and, and share with us about how they achieved objectives? Um, well, they very much had a faith in democracy. I mean, they felt that one person, one vote, um, the political and like political and economic democracy, they start saw how like large corporations and these robber barons were having an influence on our democracy. And so they were trying to do things where you'd have like a more democratic republic, as opposed to start to see the influence of like Jay Gould or these other like robber barons influencing society. And like they saw the corrupting influence of um, massive amounts of wealth on society. So campaigning for things like the secret ballot, that's a lot of things just talking to students. People don't realize that when you voted, <laughs> it was some, some places a very public affair. <laughs> You're putting that ticket that says Democrat or Republican or populist voting, having to vote sometimes in front of your boss or landlord <laughs> and so what, who you're voting for. And Greg, your book very much deals with the ideas too. So how do you see it? Political ideology, political methodology? Well, it's interesting. I've never thought about applying the word methodology to it. Uh, you know, I, I guess I sort of take my my cue from Michael Kazin, who, who described it, who described populism more as a political style. Um, in which it's certainly not an ideology per se, but a political style in which um, politicians appeal to, uh, you know, make a, appeals to the masses and particularly sort of to the common man. And they pit the common man against out of touch elites. Uh, those can be economic elites or, or political elites in places like Austin or Washington. Um, and 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 of course, when you when you use that sort of definition, it it means that populism can actually put be put to the service of a lot of different ideologies. Uh, it, that methodology, to use your term, can be can be put to the service. It, it can be a populism of the of the left or a populism of the right, which of course is more of what we tend to see. Uh, in the modern day, when that P word is used in our modern political discourse, I'm sure we'll get to that later. Um, so, so that's really the, so, sort of the way I, I view the word populism as this as this political style, and or maybe I'll start calling it a methodology. Oh well, I I like that that's caught on now. I think you know because uh, I I mean maybe maybe it's because recently I've been talking to students about populism, and you've said a brought this up, Greg, in a way, you've alluded to it, that there's a there's a difference between the populism of Texas in the 19th century and the populism of today. And your book deals a little bit with that, but do you want to characterize that a little bit further or elaborate on it? Well, the pop, the populism of the 1890s was, I mean, they, they didn't have the terminology of the political left and the political right, but it, it was very much, a, it was very much a, 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 a it was a populism of the political left uh, in the 1890s, for sure. It was a populism that, in, that I argue that modern liberals could sort of identify, can, can sort, sort of understand, sort of identify with. It in, envisioned an expanded role for government. Uh, it uh, it was suspicious of corporate power and thought that corporate power needed to be restrict, restrained, but it also thought that gov that the power of government, at least to the extent that government could be used in corrupt ways or or as a or as a handmaiden of of of, of the corporations, that, that 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 government power ought to also be restrained. Uh, so so 
you know, populists of the 1890s were suspicious of both too much government power and too much corporate power. And their idea was to place that power in the hands of, of ordinary people uh, wielded through their elected servants. It's interesting that Tom brought up democracy and you've, you've raised it there as well. I mean, I think we're going to come back to that. You know, Jeff has some questions about it. I wanted to ask you as well, and, and maybe this is uh, directed to Tom in the first instance, is that uh, one of the, the objectives of this podcast is to internationalize the Gilded Age and Progressive Era history. And despite the fact that we're delving into state politics and even regional politics, maybe, uh, Tom, in your book, you point out that the politics of Texas are transnational. And, and Greg, I mean, you've written about this, too, with the Anglo connections in, in your past writings. But can you each tell us how your books show those international influences? I mean, we mentioned the frontier, but I think there's a, a lot more to it. And maybe, Tom, if you start us off. Yes, um, my book, um, Toward the Cooperative Commonwealth, begins actually in Prussia, in Germany, in the in the 1840s. And this is just one component of populism. It's like you alluded to, Greg talks about there's an Anglo component as well. But I bring about the, the influence of German 48ers, um, those that participated in the 1848 German Revolution, and what they bring to um, Texas politics. And many of these... What's more, this, the second generation of these German 48ers, in particular, you have someone, Edward Otto Meitzen, whose father was a um, 48er, as well as his uncle was a, a actual more of a, a leader in um, Silesia um, of during the 1848 um, revolution. And that very much influenced a, the large German component of Texas, which at one point, I believe, was like 30 percent of the population um, in Texas. In, I might be wrong. I'm sorry, like there's about 30,000 Germans in, in, in Texas around this time. And you see them influencing um, state politics during Reconstruction. Of course, Civil War was difficult times for them. Um, but during re, uh, in Reconstruction, in opposition to things like the institutionalization of tenant farming, where you have in Fayette and Bastrop counties, this is in between um, Austin and Houston, where Germans, um, along German Texans, along with some Anglo allies, form a People's Party in 1873. Um, it's not how, how much you're going to characterize that as a populist party, but it had some of the same influences. And so you see from this foundation of this kind of decades-long political activism. So it's a populist movement does, does, doesn't pop out of nowhere. You have decades pre previous with some with deep political experience, including revolution in Europe, that they bring to bear um, on their the political culture of Texas. Greg, do you want to pick up on that? Well, you know, t t Tom's done a much deeper dive into the international uh, roots of of uh, of. Uh, want to use the word radical. I don't always use the word radical, maybe as much as he does, uh, politi Texas politics, but uh, out of the mainstream uh, Texas politics in the in the Gilded Age. But uh, it certainly is was evident to me, and I probably should have said more about this in my book, that that Texas, Texas pop, and he takes a much, Tom takes a much broader chronological viewpoint than I do. I really do start in the 1870s and, and get to the 1890s really quickly. But but uh, it's certainly true that populists in the 1880s and 90s, if you read their newspapers, they are all the time looking at European models uh, for various political and economic programs. I mean, they look to European models for precedents for the sub-treasury plan. They look to, Euro to European models for uh, government ownership of the railroads and telegraphs. Uh, uh, th th and, and they they uh, they look, they sip in a, the, oh, they spill an ocean of ink writing about European monetary policy, both good at, both for the good and the bad, mostly the bad, I, I would say. Uh, and, and, and so the idea the idea that that Texas populists, uh, and for that, and, and I think for other sort of agrarian political, third party political movements, the idea that they are somehow these sort of insular people who are hunkered down in their small town county seats, 
you know, whether it's Hallettsville or, or, or Corsicana, you know, uh, uh, dreaming up their own little sort of small backwoods Southern American political solutions. That's certainly not true. Uh, they were they were surprisingly cosmopolitan people in their reading habits and their thinking habits. And I think you you uh, need look no further than Charles McCune, uh, who's the sort of sort of brain, sort of the, the guru of 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 the of the farmers a lot, many of the farmers alliance and later populist uh, uh, policy ideas. You need look no further than McCune to see somebody who is widely read and and deeply interested in what's going on on the international scene. Wow, fascinating. And uh, I, I think I got a sniff of some disagreement there that I want to just. So <laughs> what about the word radical? Is that is that a point of is that are we contesting that the populists are radical? I mean, I don't know. Is, Greg, would, would you not call them radicals? Well, I, I, uh, well, first of all, radical is a relative term, or you know, ra radical compared, radical compared to what, right? They're certainly, they're, they certainly are radical compared to the conservatives of their time. I, I would say, um, you know, all of this, all of this terminology. Now, the word radical was around in the eighteen eighties and nineties. Um, the word liberal mostly wasn't in, in a political, really, in a strictly political sense. The word conservative was certainly around, but it was used in all sorts of different ways than it's used today. Um, populists love to call themselves to, to say that, that they were conservatives uh, at the same time that they were advocating for many causes that we would identify as liberal or leftist and that their opponents might accuse of being radical or worse. So that... Uh, all that language can can get you in trouble fast, but I get to to to, to answer your question. My, my take on on populism is that while there were radicals of the EO mites and these the sort of proto proto socialists who who became so real real socialists at some point. They were a relatively small, relatively small, and relatively fringe minority within the larger populist movement. Uh, and you can say what you, you can have an opinion whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, but uh, my my take is, is that they cut a, a relatively small thing, important in a lot of the ideas, and and many of them were pretty prominent in the party. But but they. The populists would never have gotten forty-four percent of the vote in Texas in eighteen ninety-four if if that had been their only thing. Yeah, radical. Yeah, I was. I, I agree with Greg. I don't think necessarily the on, on on terminology. I mean, like it's like I don't. It's like the pol populist would consider themselves radical. You know, they consider themselves carrying out common sense and what they thought was just and moral and correct. And they just, like I said, it was common sense. But you do, I do think some of their ideas can be like comparatively, they're comparatively radical when you're talking about nationalization of the railroads and telegraphs, the sub treasury system, the system of warehouses where the government would hold on to people's crops and until they could get a fair price for it. And you do have many, as, as Greg mentioned, you do have radicals that, even though they wouldn't necessarily use that term at that time, people who could be considered radical, like E.O. Meitzen and Lee Rhodes, who got elected to as a populist representative into the Texas legislature. He's one of the ones that goes on and becomes a socialist. And people like Thomas Nugent, one of the candidates for governor, who could he consider like a Christian socialist, not necessarily a Marxist socialist, but a, a Christian socialist. So you do have these leaders who maybe, yeah, they represent a minority faction within the um, People's Party and the populist movement, yet they're the ones, many of them were the state leaders and drawing much of the attention and building kind of what um, Lawrence Goodwin called this, this movement culture of populism 
was kind of based on some of this with economic radicalism. And that's what really spurred the populist movement, I would say, was these this radical economic message, even if they went to use the term radical at the time. I, I agree. I, I'll take that. It can get you in trouble by <laughs> using terms, applying that to people that wouldn't necessarily have used it um, themselves. Right there. So I'll take that. No, I think, it's, I think it's good. I think the language, the, the discussion around language is important because you're, you're both very right. I think it's a comparative thing. And actually, liberal, progressive, conservative could all be comparable as well. Uh, I got to pass over to Jeff for, for a little bit here because I've, I still have more questions for you. But I know Jeff has got some wonderful questions to ask you, too, as well. So, Jeff, take it away. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you both for, for being here. This is a great opportunity. Obviously, this is a, a subject that I'm very deeply invested in. And these are, are two books that I absolutely uh, enjoyed and, yes, have dog-eared many, many pages uh, of both of these these recent books. And I, I think I, I want to start off with a question um, that is applicable to both, um, but I'll direct it first towards Greg. How did uh, race and ethnicity uh, shape the political blocks in Texas, particularly the farmer labor block that became the heart of populism? Oh boy. Well, of course, race seems like in anything having to do with American history, certainly Southern history, certainly Texas history, at virtually any point in time, race is always the most complicated uh, and confounding uh, uh, topic. Uh, and it certainly was uh, where the populists are concerned. The populists could do math, and they knew that in a in an electorate where where whites, I mean, populists are only I forget the percentage now. They're less than twenty percent of the population of the state. But in an electorate where whites are evenly divided, uh, blacks who continue to vote in very large numbers all the way up to the turn of the century. Um, they they could hold the balance of power um, if they chose to, if they if they voted more or less as a block and chose to throw their support to one side or the other uh, they could they could they couldn't they couldn't call the shots but they could be the kingmaker in a way and so populists knew that and they knew that to have any chance of winning elections that they had to uh, they had to appeal to black voters so there's that. And in Texas, of course, uh, non-Anglo ethnics uh, played much the same role. As Tom said, there are a lot of Germans in Texas. There are a lot of uh, there are a lot of Mexicans and Mexican Americans. And when I say Mexicans and Mexican Americans, it is important to note that that you did not have to be a citizen to vote. In Texas in the 19th century. In fact, not until the 1920s did we abolish um, did we abolish alien suffrage. Um, and so Mexicans and Mexican Americans were an important vote. And then there's the whole sort of kaleidoscope of, of other European ethics uh, apart from Germans. There are a gazillion Irish in Texas. People don't real often don't realize that. And lots of poles and checks and winds and you name it. Um, so, so all of that is really important uh, to to the populists, and they they have out sort of outreach programs, <laughs> outreach strategies to uh, to reach all of these groups, and they have varying levels of success at it. And and one of the things they really had to do was try to recruit people like e, like E.O. Meitzen. Whom Tom has written about. I mean, Il Meitzen was the preeminent German Texan leader among the populace, and boy, did they value him because he could he could he could make German votes down in down in his part of the the state that that no one else could. Yeah, he Il Meitzen traveled Texas speaking in English and German, and I've even haven't was I wasn't able to confirm it, but it also even spoke a little bit of Czech too. I mean, so he was very valuable. And this is a time when Germans were not considered in part of like the white mainstream. I mean, they're considered outside kind of the dominant Anglo culture of Texas. And as Greg said, they, they described one kind of hostile paper described um, E.O. Meitzen as a German worm on a hook to try to attract <laughs> the, the German vote. 
but yeah, Greg described it very well. I mean, like how important race and ethnicity was and and winning over the African American vote. Because Texas, Texas, up until you get to this populist moment where you actually do have a real challenge to the Democratic Party. I mean, Texas was one party state. Um, but you had many African Americans maintaining a loyalty to the um Republican Party, not just because it was the party of Lincoln and the party of emancipation. Of course, it's it greatly transformed by this time, but at a time period when you still have the political patronage system in place and the Republicans are winning the executive branch in the White House, and you have those federal patronage systems, but I mean, spoils system to dole out, being a Republican in Texas and to be able to get those custom house jobs and post office jobs, that had real material benefits for um, African Americans and makes them kind of hesitant to give that up to then switch to the populist movement. So to ask a, another question about what makes some of the, the populist, and I think the Maitin family uh, definitely is an example of this unique, is maybe views that were outside the mainstream, certainly outside the mainstream in Texas for the time on religion and gender. Uh, so I'll start with, with Tom with that question. How do the mites and families sort of differ from, from other uh, Texans during their time on, on those issues? Yeah, they weren't deeply religious people. I, I believe they did. Um, it's part of just more of a cultural practice and a social thing, kind of nominally belong to the Lutheran church. But I don't find them as very spiritual or very religious and that is very much outside kind of of the texas mainstream and so that's one of the things they would might sins and other like would be accused of of being anti-religious um when he this is outside after the populist era when he was running for um for county county judge of lavaca county in um, 1904 and then re-election in 1906 he was accused of being anti-catholic i mean it was one of the things that continually a smear they would put on as being, as being anti-religious. And so they were outside um, the norm of that. But you'd see them, especially when they get a little bit later, when it gets into the socialist phase, they would use the language of evangelical Protestantism to appeal to Texans, even if they weren't specifically evangelical Protestants themselves. <laughs> but they, they, they realized what, who their audience was. Right here, it gets to the populace. I mean, they realize the, the they, they're appealing to the people, and so and people are religious, and so they use that language to a, a evangelical Protestantism to appeal to average Texans. So, Greg, what do you what do you find the the populist views on religion to be? And also, uh, in your book, you mentioned quite a bit about uh, populist views in, on gender and how the, their conceptions differ uh, from the the Democrats that they opposed. Right. So. Uh... While it's, it is certainly true that populists uh, uh, did not hesitate to invoke, as Tom said, to invoke the sort of language of, of evangelical Protestantism. Um, remember, I guess for, at, at the start of our discussion today, I, I, I mentioned that populists are sort of overtly anti-elitist. Anti and that carried over into po sort of populists and religion uh, populists were very disproportionately represented in the ranks of the so-called restorationist sects, particularly the Disciples of Christ, uh, the Primitive Baptists, and, and some others. Uh, a, a, a Protestant, Protestant movements that that were highly critical of. What had happened to the mainstream Protestant meaning really Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterians and Episcopalians, what had happened to those, to those denominations in the modern era, uh, especially in the towns, in the county seats and in the, in the cities uh, where these, you know, these denominations had kind of engaged in a race to see who can build the grandest, uh, the grandest church buildings and, and, you know, those sorts of, that they refer often referred to churchianity uh, as opposed to Christianity. And so part of their sort of anti-elitist uh, approach carried over into religion and they were much more interested in the in these restorationist sects 
that that harken back to a purer, more simple, more genuine uh, brand of Christianity. Um, a lot of criticism in the populist press about they they would refer to long tailed preachers with their with their you know diamond stick pins and the fancy clothes and all and that they were really down on a lot of that kind of stuff. But it's also very interesting that populism is the political home of of all of the so called nonconformists and infidels of the state. I was really struck by every time, almost every time you find somebody who holds unconventional, unorthodox uh, religious views, they were almost always an outspoken populist. And one of one of the really interesting phenomena is that uh, there was a there was a, a nonconformist club of Dallas. Uh, and it was it was a club made basically an atheist's club and with a bunch of prominent members, you know, who were sort of fairly prominent people in Dallas society. And it, and it was basically the populist monthly meeting at the, at the meeting of the Dallas Nonconformist Club. Uh, so you get a little bit of that, too, which, which I think is is very interesting. Now, uh, for the for the second part of Jeff's question about gender. Uh, a lot of this sort of carries over into their ideas about gender. Um, populists, I argue, were in the midst of sort of reformulating ideas about gender uh, that were a rejection of sort of traditional Southern ideas of patriarchy. Um, the idea that the, the 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 man is the head of the household and and his, you know, his his wife and children and whatever other dependents they have are 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 his dependents, and and you know they follow his lead and and he's the master of the household and and those ideas carrying over into politics. Populists argued are those are those are part and parcel of the past. Populists, Texas populists were modernizers by and large. And so part of their ideas about modernization was that we need to modernize gender roles. Uh, and, and we do that by emphasizing uh, 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 ma redefining masculinity as uh, dignity and uh, and uh, sort of sort of. Uh, 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 earnestness and forthrightness and tr tr transparency, if they had had that term in, the, in those days, um, uh, being frank. And when, they, that, when populists talked about a politician made a manly speech, they mean he didn't get up and pound the platform and brandish a pistol and do all these things that Democrats were famous for doing. And, and 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 use metaphors of war and conquest, but rather populists would say you need to you need to approach your political campaign in a in a dignified uh, sort of intellectual manner, and this carried over in, again into their sort of dealings with women. Uh, populists welcomed women into their political conventions, uh, not not as voting delegates necessarily, but uh, they placed they placed women on their uh, on their speakers platforms. Women spoke at populist uh, meetings and gatherings and conventions and were given a respectable hearing. Um, there were a number of, and, and this was really a carryover from the Farmers Alliance, where where women were accepted as full members of the alliance. Um, and many individual populists. Uh, were very sympathetic toward the idea of, of woman suffrage. The party did not adopt woman suffrage as one of its planks because their argument was, and this was an argument made by leading populist women, there'll be time for that once we're in power. Uh, let's not let's not fracture the coalition right now by getting, and again, that gets back to the question of radicalism. Let's don't get too radical on this woman question ahead of its time uh, put the populists in office 
and women's rights will follow. It was really their argument. Yeah, what Greg was saying, Billy was saying on gender, you had an individual like Betty Gay, who was from the Lavaca and um, Fayette area, and she was a for suffrage. But as Greg was saying, she wasn't going to push that because they felt that women could get equality through economic equality is what they saw. So they thought that the, the message of populist um, economic message, that would help raise women up. And then once you get, like Greg was saying, once you get that economic standing, and you had a lot of women that were running farms and ranches at this time. I mean, it was tough times. The, the man would die. And so you had women running large families or large farms. And so the economic message of populism appealed to them. And so I guess, and the and suffrage would come later. <laughs> so with um, Greg's invocation of the, the populist as modernizers, he's hearkening back to Charles Postel's argument in the populist vision. And that book, of course, did a lot for populist studies in terms of, of uh, challenging the existing historiography. And one of the things that it did was uh, maybe turn the focus to a more national uh, level and inspired studies of populism in, in places beyond uh, the South and beyond Texas, um, much like it was throughout much of the 20th century when the focus on study of, of populism maybe was on the Central Plains in places like Kansas. And I think it's interesting that 50 years ago uh, to the decade, right, uh, Lawrence Goodwin, Robert McMath, they bring the attention in populist studies to Texas. And I want to know, do you think that taken together, your two books uh, are making any sort of statement about uh, refocusing uh, the study of populism onto Texas, or will they inspire new generations of scholarship on populisms in, in, in Texas, or is it just a coincidence? Um, well, <laughs> I was, a lot of our, we were... Greg and I, I think, I'm sure, look, a lot of our, our research paths were overlapping at times like that because I was just working on my um, my dissertation and master's thesis at the time encountering some of the same people. And I was thinking of like my second book would be a book on Texas, um, history of Texas populism. And I was like, nope, never mind. That's that's taken care of <laughs> for a while. So I, I can move on to other things um, because Greg's great book is going to be the standard bearer for um, for that for um, quite a while. But I think Texas, I think it, Texas does deserve a lot of the focus because this is where you have Texas, where you had the middle of the road populism. I mean, they're going to stick in the middle. They're not going to go Democrat or Republican. And and so at the beginning, it's, Texas, it comes out of the Farmers Alliance. So Greg said it is Texas is the birthplace of populism. And it's it's where you kind of get the un I don't want to say unfiltered populism, so to speak, where it was involved with fusion and with the Democrats in the Great Plains, or you have in the North Carolina, where it fused with the um, Republican Party. So if you want like kind of unadulterated populism, Texas is where it needs to be. And I do hope there's many other studies, um, even though um, Postel's book did nationalize a little bit i'd still like to see more on like california populism what was going on there um so hopefully we will see more <laughs> real quick uh before greg answers that question will will one or both of you give a quick definition of fusion for for listeners who, who may not know the term <laughs> just fusing with it was often with the the weaker of the two um main party the democrats or the republicans to um for an act law. So in like the Great Plains, the um, the populists frequently fused with the Democratic Party, had joint campaigns. And in, in the North Carolina, they fused with the Republican Party to achieve electoral office. So. Yeah, what they what they usually what they usually did, uh, it, it would the, the two parties would get together and they would they would uh, divide up a ticket. Right. And so you know, oh, uh, congressional seats. We'll give the Republicans four of our congressional seats and the populists will get five of our congressional seats and they'll run as one ticket and therefore get all of the combined Repu Republican and populist vote. And together, maybe we can defeat the Democrats. In, you know, in a two-party system, a two-party winner-take-all system where you have to have 50% plus one vote uh, to win an election, 
Uh, of course, that's that's why third parties don't work in in our country. This was this was an era of much uh, experimentation with trying to have this sort of honorable or maybe not so honorable cooperation between two two uh, minority parties in order to in order to defeat uh, the majority party, and it. it it always had problems. It, it 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 sometimes worked temporarily in places like North Carolina, I guess most notably uh, Kansas and some other places. And it worked at the local level a lot, a lot of places in the at the county level. Uh, the populists and Republicans in the 1890s would get together and and divvy up the uh, the votes. And this often involved, of course, also combining black and white votes in a polit- it's a political coalition building is what it is. So so one other question then, Greg, I want you to get back to um, sort of the historiographical imports of your, your two works taken together. Um, middle of the road. When we hear middle of road today, sometimes folks think that means moderate. Did that mean moderate to the populist? No, no, it didn't. It meant in, in populist jargon, uh, being a middle of the roader meant that you were sticking to to uh, to orthodox populist uh, doctrine or policies. Uh, you were not straying from the populist platform, whatever platform, what, whichever populist platform you happen to be talking about, a state platform or a national platform or whatever. You stayed in the middle of the road, meaning you didn't venture off into these fusion deals. Uh, and you did you you didn't you didn't support a Democrat here or a Republican there. You were a sort of Simon pure populist. So what do you think? Your two books taken together is this going to inspire a new generation of populist scholarship on Texas itself, or is this just a, a coincidence? Oh, I you know I wouldn't have any idea uh, how to answer that. That will be for other that will be for other scholars to answer. Um, I keep thinking I'm done with with populism, but I, but even when I start on a new project that ostensibly doesn't involve it, I find myself getting sucked back into it in some ways. Um, you know, there have been there have been a number of fine works uh, about that, that touched on populism. In, 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 besides the ones we've mentioned, you know, Donna Barnes's uh, a, a book in the 1980s uh, was what was a really important. Uh, and, and useful book. She was she was an anthropo- she is an anthropologist and sort of employed anthropological theory, which was really useful to me uh, in that book. And of course, you can go all the way back to the 1930s. Roscoe Martin wrote the original and still incredibly valuable uh, uh, book, The People's Party in Texas. And he had the advantage of being able to interview old populists uh, uh, for that book. And uh, Matt Hill's book uh, on populist and greenbackers uh, and Knights of Labor, which was just a few years old, uh, another very useful addition. So I think the books, you know, they may come in waves, but I think they, you know, they keep they keep trundling along. What if I can jump back in here? I just I just heard the word experimentation being talked about, and we've heard about a few states. You know, North Carolina's mentioned. California, I would be remiss if I didn't bring up North Dakota, which is where, of course, Jeff and I are coming from right now. And and really, what I really want to talk about is the Nonpartisan League. For anyone who might know what the Nonpartisan League is, it was a socialist movement closely associated with farmers and laborers that had really remarkable success in North Dakota, uh, among other parts of the Midwest as well. But Tom, your book shows the NPL, the Nonpartisan League, is part and parcel of American political history, rather than a movement that was experimentation like we heard. Um, but how do you come to that conclusion about the NPL? Well, there, the, the, the NPL was carrying out some, this, this, these ideas, Go many of them go back to the 1870s and the Greenback Labor Party. Um, so there are things that have been discussed. I mean, they just became experimental in North Dakota where they actually had it, where they won um, state power, I mean, state government power in North Dakota in 1915. And so it became experimental. They were actually able to enact them <laughs> and to bring them out, have like state run grain elevators, um, state um, crop insurance, um, farm insurance. And so that's when it became the experiment in state banks. But otherwise, these ideas, like I said, were part and parcel of kind of like farmer labor 
ideology and demands going back decades right there. So I like that you called it a socialist movement. That's what another point. <laughs> point we did have a conversation, with. Jeff and I, about whether we call it a movement or a party, because obviously NPL is at the end of the Democratic Party in North Dakota. It's still there. That remedy yeah. is there. The bank, the bank is still there. So the experiment, as you rightly point out, not only has its continuity in the ideas that predate it, but it has a continuity in legacy today that yeah. I'm not sure a lot of people are aware of. I mean, outside of North Dakota, I mean, I grew up in New Jersey. I can guarantee you no one in New Jersey knows about the state bank of North Dakota, but yeah. they should. It's really, it's really important. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's like the, I mean, in Minnesota, just because of the farmer labor movement, it's the farmer labor democratic party. I mean, it goes, it's not just the democratic party in Minnesota. I mean, it has these traditions that go back further. I mean, yeah. Yes. And, and, and I, I, I think you can't emphasize enough the, the sort of continuity of a lot of these ideas, uh, you know, the pop, uh, you know, I'm I'm sort of a fan of the populists, I guess, in a lot of ways. But the populists didn't invent very many of their ideas. I mean, they they got so many of these ideas from previous third party and independent and labor movements, particularly labor movements. You go back to the original Knights of Labor uh, 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 platforms of the 1870s, of late 1860s, and and early 1870s, and so many of the ideas that are later taken up by greenbackers, and then and then later taken up by populists, and then later taken up by by the nonpartisan league, and and even so, and even even socialists like the Texas Socialist Party, all the, many of those same ideas just run like a thread through all those movements. And and again, we we can debate whether to call them radical or not. I you know, I don't know if they're. I don't know if they're radical or not. Is 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 the government, uh, you know, the the, the government uh, issuing low interest government loans uh, to farmers? Is that a radical idea? Well, it was radical in its day. Um, you know, my both my grandfathers were cotton farmers in West Texas, and boy, they were really enthused. They weren't very radical, but they were enthusiastic about a government uh, about a government loan to a cotton farmer. Okay, I've got another question here about democracy. It came up earlier. We, you know, Tom brought up the idea that populism stands for one one person, one vote, and therefore that. I, but you also mentioned the way we used to vote as well, Tom. You mentioned the glass bowl and sticking your ballot in there, and it was a community event. We've talked about that on the show as well about how that community event really did something for turnout, that people went out and voted collectively. And I wonder, is there a law of unintended consequences here with the populace? Because I know around the country nationwide, turnout plummets uh, after the secret ballot comes in. But what's the story with Texas? Does the does the voting turnout drop there too? It's a good question. You, maybe I'm not sure the voting percentage of voter turnout due to the secret ballot it, but it has it's a mixed bag. So, yeah, you had this large participatory democracy during this 1880s and 1890s where just it was giant rallies. It was um, large voter turnout, like in the eight high, like 80 percent voter turnout, um, torchlit parades. And now you wouldn't imagine people had torchlit parades and it's like, yikes. <laughs> like, like then it was like part of the political culture. Um, so. But also it lent, it did why the populist won it, because it did lend itself to manipulation of the vote. I mean, the courthouse rings. I mean, like I said, when you're going to vote and you have your landlord in, or your boss is right in, in, as part of the courthouse ring. And so are you going to vote against what you know your boss's particular party? Are you going to vote against them? I mean, are you still going to be able to rent that land? Are you still going to have that job? I mean, so it's a mixed thing where, yes, it, it'd be great if we had that high voter turnout that that we used to have i mean during this era but i'd, I'd still take the secret ballot over, <laughs> over. yeah this, this was a running this was a running issue all throughout the certainly throughout the 1890s uh about how we're gonna vote and who's gonna vote it's you know some i guess i guess not there's nothing new under the sun you know because all this all the talk today about these very issues uh, is in in many ways or in, in in weird sort of perverse ways is a replay of of what we had 100 
40 years ago, 30 years ago. Um, in Texas, the secret ballot was phased in. It was first adopted in cities over 10,000. And, and while, yes, it did come at a certain cost to democracy. I mean, if you couldn't read the ballot, the ballot and and you had to go in and and actually mark a ballot, the, the ballot had would have both parties can all parties candidates on it. And you had to mark, you know, circle which ones you wanted or whatever. That was a problem if you were illiterate. Uh, whereas in the old system, you got your printed ballot from your party workers outside the voting place and it only had your party's candidates on you took it in and put it in the in the in the ballot box in front of god and everybody usually right so yeah it, it came at some reduction in turnout in the cities but i think but i agree with tom i think most people most sort of people who 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 uh who who liked democracy thought that was a trade-off that they were willing to make uh, the populists in the 1890s knew that they were fighting a real uphill battle against voter against democratic voter fraud. It was just rampant and often flagrant and blatant, uh, and and so they supported all kinds of reform measures. It was one of their major talking points in election after election was cleaning up the corruption surrounding elections. Now, there were other things you could do, for example, like trying to eliminate alcohol from elections. That was a real problem because the standard practice, of course, was on election day, at the polling place, or maybe away from the polling place, you get your voters. You, if you're, you know, you're a planter or a or a or a factory owner, or you get you get or a ward healer or whatever. You get your people all liquored up, and then you hand them the ballot you want them to cast, and they stagger to the polls and put them in, and and that's that. And, and people make sure that they're there because they want the they want the they want the whiskey and they want the barbecue and and all that stuff. And it was, you know, it was just, uh, it was, it was, uh, it was an invitation to corruption. And so populists uh, try to, they try to put a lid on, on some of that sort of thing. Uh, they try to pass laws, uh, uh, jacking up the, pen the criminal penalties for voter fraud. Um, and of course that stuff gets voted down uh, over and over again. On the other hand, you also have Democrats uh, in virtually every legislature from the 1870s to the turn of the century. Democrats are introducing poll tax bills in Texas and the Texas legislature, hoping to crack down to, to, to crack down on poor voters, be they poor whites or poor blacks or poor whatever Mexicans. Um, those as long as as long as populists and other sort of third party players are, uh, you know, are on the scene, they vote those down every year. And then in 1902, after the populist party has been defeated, boom, there you go. There's your poll tax. And, and so it's a little bit hard to know about, about uh, how, how much sort of reforms might have affected voter turnout and therefore affected democracy because once Texas uh, outlaw, uh, outlaws blacks voting in the in the primaries, you know, they institute the white primary, and they institute the poll tax that makes it financially impossible for for many poor people to vote. Voter turnout plummets to a fraction of what it had been for the last twenty five years, and so we don't really know what effect other reforms might have had. Yeah, paying a dollar fifty to vote was a lot back then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's obviously not just one thing. And obviously, some states like Texas have a range of different variables than, say, I don't know, Vermont. But, uh, uh, Jeff, you've got a couple other questions, I think, to, to yeah, finish off. Yeah, yeah, I got a couple questions, one one for each of you and probably should have been sort of our first questions. Uh, but, Tom, would you briefly introduce some of the, the main characters from each of the three generations of the Bitesen family that you uh, present in your book? 
Yes. Um, so my book, Toward a Cooperative Commonwealth, uses three generations of a German Texan family to kind of trace the evolution and continuity of, I'll say, agrarian radicalism. <laughs> I'll go ahead and say the term radicalism um, through Texas. Um, it kind of uses the form of a, like a multi-generation biography. And it's mainly to humanize the story, to kind of hopefully to make it more approachable to a wider audience. Um, the first generation is Otto Meitzen. Um, he was a millwright in, um, in, in Prussia, in Eastern Prussia and Silesia. He participated in 1848 German Revolution. Um, you know, that didn't go well for them. So they fled to Texas where they kind of had romantic notions of what Texas was, and they hoped it's at relative isolation at the time and allow them to kind of continue their German heritage. Um, so you have Otto Meitz in the first generation, um, and then he very much influenced his son, Edward Otto E.O. Meitzen, who starts off kind of as a greenbacker, but then gets he's in the Democratic Party fold, um, and then through experience of the Democratic Party and kind of feeling betrayed by um, Jim Hogg, the governor who didn't, who was originally measured up to the Alliance yardstick and then didn't once he was in office and he becomes a populist. And through kind of the experiences of populism, when it falls apart, he becomes a socialist. And then it goes on to the third generation, E.R. Ernest Richard Meitzen, who becomes part of the Farmers Union in Texas, and then also the Socialist Party becoming one of the statewide leaders of the Texas Socialist Party, including um, being its candidate for governor and one of the editors of the very successful um, Rebel, the Rebel newspaper out of Hallettsville, Texas, becomes the third largest um, socialist newspaper in the country. And this, the name doesn't come, it's, oh, it's the South, it's Texas, it's the Rebel, has some kind of Confederate connotation. No, that was actually the Texas Socialist Party was more part of the left wing of the Texas Socialist Party, more in line with Big Bill Haywood and opposition. They were rebelling against the Victor Berger socialist um, up in Milwaukee. So it's the three generations that I go over. <laughs> it's great. Thank you. Uh, so, Greg, your books, The People's Revolt, Texas Populist and the Roots of American Liberalism. We spent a lot of time today talking about the origins of the populist. Maybe spend a minute for us speaking about the legacies of Texas populist. Well, as the the subtitle of my book indicates, uh, I, I I make the argument, and I admit that it's that it's a it's it's a somewhat tentative argument and a very difficult one to to prove uh, that the that the ideas pioneered by Texas pop, populists in the eighteen nineties lived on uh, lived on long after the the. People's Party uh, was gone as a political force, um, and that and that if you look at the actual both of the sort of political philosophy of of Texas populists, uh, and if you look at many of their many of their specific sort of policy uh, programs, that that many of those lived on in uh, in progressive politics of both parties uh, in the progressive era, and they find expression in various New Deal programs, and they find, uh, they find expressions in the great society and modern, and for that matter, modern liberalism. Um, so while, while even I think many of these latter day sort of li liberal, poli liberal politicians in this country would not have would not have acknowledged or even known about populist influence. My argument is that these ideas were really sort of mainstreamed uh, in the 1890s and, and and picked up by 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 latter politicians. I use I use Lyndon Johnson's family as a sort of as a sort of uh, shorthand uh, for. For this idea, uh, uh, Lyndon's grandfather, uh, Sam Ely Johnson, was a was a popular was was a Farmers Alliance lecturer um, in the Texas Hill Country. Ran for the uh, state legislature against his own son-in-law, by the way, uh, as a populist in 1892, and was a member of the first populist state executive committee. His son. Um, 
what was a, a progressive Democrat in the 19 teens and 20s. And then, of course, Lyndon Johnson uh, ends up being a, a ardently pro-New Deal uh, congressman and eventually sort of off, author of the Great Society programs of the 1960s. And, and Lyndon Johnson, you know, in, a, in, a, in an interview um, uh, after he was after I think after he was out of the presidency, told the story of sort of sitting on his grandfather's knee on the Pernalis River uh, and hearing his grandfather talk about populism and, uh, you know, the, the need for the, the government to, uh, you know, to take a more active role in, in helping, he said, helping the farmer get out of the mud. Um, uh, one, one of the, one of the, my favorite quotes from a, from a Texas populist uh, was, was from a, a very, very fascinating populist from Brownwood, Texas named Charles Jenkins. And, and, and Jenkins said, said, I've never been afraid of that scarecrow, strong, gov strong government. I want a government strong enough, enough to protect the life, liberty, and property of the citizens. And I thought that sort of encapsulated what, what populists believed. Uh, and, and that's the sort of philosophy, I think, that, that they bequeathed to later generations of liberals. I'm shocked to learn that Donald Trump is not in the line of uh, progressives dating back to the 1890s. No, of course, I'm I'm not. But uh, Tom, Greg, you've both been so modest and humble about your books. You don't want to say that they're reshaping the discourse on Gilded Age and progressive era politics. So I'll say it. Your books are reshaping the discourse on Gilded Age and progressive era politics. And I'm so grateful for both of you to, to join the show. And Jeff Wells as well, who I have to thank for suggesting the topic and who himself is a, 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 an expert on this, this topic of, of populism. It's really rounding out. We haven't talked about populism, and I hope this is plugging a, a, a massive Texas size gap in the podcast's coverage. So thanks a million, guys. Thank you. It's an honor. Thanks. It's been great. Thanks, Michael. Well, that's all we have time for. Thanks for listening. You can follow the Gilded Age and Progressive Era on Twitter or on my website, michaelpatrickcullinane.com. Please consider subscribing or reviewing the podcast wherever you listen because it really makes a big difference and helps direct others to the show. I hope you'll join me again for the next episode.